Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Is the Bible reliable? And not just reliable, but is it absolute truth from God? Meaning, knowledge of man rather than the knowledge that God gives to us in his word. What we're going to do is to begin a study in the book of Genesis. Now, according to the rabbis, every theological doctrine that the scripture reveals, we see the foundation, the basis for that doctrine right here in the book of Genesis. Everything that we need to know is in this book. Naturally, it becomes clearer, it is developed, we find a, a coming forth of greater revelation as we continue in the scriptures, but the foundation is right here in this first book called Bereshit, or the book of Genesis. And what I intend to do is to begin today with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and continue verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all the way through the book of Genesis. Now, you may be familiar with our teachings, whether you find them on television or whether on the internet, but what we're doing today is specially for the internet. That means none of these lessons are going to be shown on television. They are going to be done in order to give you extra content. We want to provide more teaching to you so that you can grow quicker, and be able to discern truth in your life and understand what God has done, what he's doing, and how he's going to bring about his kingdom in the future. And a great place to begin is right here in the book of Genesis. Now, everyone knows that Genesis begins with the account of creation. We see this account in Genesis chapter 1, but also in Genesis chapter 2. And it is not two different accounts, meaning, well, here's one presentation of creation, and here's an entirely different one. That's not what the scripture does. Rather, we see an account of creation from two different perspectives. So we have a fuller revelation. There's nothing in conflict with one another. Rather, through these two presentations of the one creation, we have a better understanding of what God wants us to know so that we can apply that biblical truth to our life. And over and over, I want to emphasize how doctrine, truth from the scripture, theological revelation is not simply to know, but so that we can apply it to our life, that our walk and that term walking is very important because we see that in the New Testament for revealing a lifestyle. One of my favorite verses, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, it says there, as you have received Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, into your life, so walk in him. That term walk is a lifestyle. It is in regard to how one lives his behavior. So the purpose of this Bible study that we're beginning today in the book of Genesis and all the studies we do is to impact your walk with Messiah, to cause you to behave differently from those who do not know the truth. So without any other delay, let's begin. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 1. Now, there are going to be individuals, and unfortunately, in the evangelical world, and what I mean by that is those who not only call themselves believers, but, but who are conservative in their faith. 
Unfortunately, we're seeing that term evangelical becoming less and less relevant. Why do I say that? Because more and more evangelicals are not believing truth. They are embracing scientific explanations and trying to rationalize these scientific explanations into the scripture. Reconcile what man says and what God says. And that is a shame. We need, and I said it earlier, and I want to say it again, we need to accept Scripture as God's perfect, His inerrant revelation to us, that we can take hold of it and know that it's true and will be a source of blessing in and through our life. What do I mean by that? Well, not only can we find blessing, but one of the primary purposes that God blesses an individual is so that he or she can bless someone else, that God's glory might be manifested to others. His presence in your life and my life might be seen and recognized in the eyes of other people so that they would want that same thing that we graciously have received through the blood of of Messiah Yeshua. And that blood brings about such a change, an eternal change. But look at verse 1. We read here, and we're going to be translating from the Hebrew in a very literal manner. It says here, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, almost everyone can quote that verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. End of verse 1. Now, here's the problem. Many people, and as I said, it's becoming ever more increasingly true among so-called believers that they want to say, well, after verse 1, but before verse 2, we have billions of years. That is a false statement. Now, one of the questions that I frequently receive is this. Do I believe in an old earth, meaning 13 billion years old or something like that? Some will say the entire creation is 13 billion years old, but the earth is is newer than that. I'm not going to get into all of that. Let me just simply say this. I believe that God's creation of all things is, is very young, about 6,000 years old or a little bit older than that. So 6,000 plus years, that's what I believe based upon the revelation of God's word. And I do not believe in the gap theory. What is that? That after verse 1 but before verse 2, well, then we have a, a place there for billions of years to pass from God's initial creation and then when he began to work in this earth, making man and setting up uh, earth as we have come to know it. I reject that totally. Now, there's another thing that we're going to be talking about when we get into chapter 2, and that is how so often what you're reading in English has been altered. Words are left out. Words are wrongly translated where it's very clear and obvious what the meaning of that word is. And I'll give examples as we press through the book of of Genesis. But again, look at verse 1. In the beginning, now we translate it, God created. But learn something, and you'll see why this is important in a moment. In the biblical language... Now, I'm going to focus in on Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament. Primarily, there's also a few chapters in Aramaic. But but in the biblical language, we find something normative, meaning the vast majority of the time, here's the situation. We usually have a verb followed by a noun. So instead of saying, in the beginning, God created in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, created God. Now, it means the same thing. It's just in Hebrew, there's a preference, an overwhelming preference or tendency to put the verb first 
and then the subject of that verb immediately thereafter. That's normative. And that's exactly what we have in verse 1. So again, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, notice that last word in verse 1. It is the word ha'aretz, the earth. Now, when you come to verse 2, the author, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, who was inspired by God to write this down in exactly the fashion that he did, the word order, the constructions of the word, the grammatical constructions that he used, everything, it was inspired fully, completely by God. And what we need to realize is this. In verse 2, there is a message to the reader. What is the first word in verse 2? The answer is, and. So verse 2 begins with a conjunction. What's the purpose of a conjunction? To unite one thought with another thought, meaning to bring them together, to unite them. Now, there's something very interesting. You will find English translations that leave out the word and in verse 2. Why? Because their theology, what they want to convey to you is this, that after verse 1, but before verse 2, billions and billions of years have, have passed. So they don't want that conjunction in verse 2 because that verse 2 with the conjunction and would mean that it's, there's a continuation of thought. And the theory that billions of years have transpired would be very problematic. But, but Moses, he does even more to show that there's no billions of years that have transpired from the end of verse 1 to the beginning of verse 2. Now, again, I want to pause for a moment and say more and more in the conservative believing, the conservative Christian world, and also among liberal rabbis, and I'm talking about reform and conservative and even some orthodox rabbis, they are adapting science as a means of interpreting the scripture. And what happens? Well, when you do that, you're forced to do something. You are forced to pay less attention to the text itself when you say, well, what science says is true, and therefore we have to adapt Scripture. What I would say is this. If it's accurate science, but much of science is theory presented at fact, simply not the case. Let me give you an example of this. Someone will pick up a rock and they'll say, well, we're going to date that rock. And through carbon dating and through other means, they say, well, this rock is, is so many thousand years old because of, of the carbon that's left in it. Here's the problem. Do we know when God created that rock, how much carbon was initially in it? We don't. Here's the rule of thumb, and I hope you've heard many other people say this. I'm just repeating it. You know, when Adam, the first man, and Chava, or Eve, the, second, the first woman, was, was created, were they little tiny infants and then they grew up? No. They were created with age. Likewise, trees and other things were made. And they were not in a beginning state, but they were in a mature state. So when we look at creation, we see maturity to that creation. Likewise, people want to look at the, the, what we call in Hebrew the yakum. That is not just the, the galaxies or universe or the solar system. It's everything. And when you put that all together, they'll say, well, according to science, it began from one location and it's moving out. And they say, we can observe that today. It's still moving out. That's true. But here's the problem. How do we know when God created things? You know, it says that he made the sun and the moon and the stars. It wasn't that he began something and then after the fact, billions of years later, 
there's a star, there's a moon. No, he put things all together. Initially, there was, and it's grown, it's matured, it's spread out, that's true. But we should not look at this, this yakum, this, this universe and all that's within it, the galaxies and the solar systems and such. We should not look at it and say, okay, it all began at zero. God could have spoken, that's what he did, by the way. He spoke things into being and he could have spoke it into being where it had maturity, meaning what would take billions of years to come about if it started at one location and grew out. God could have started with it already mature, already growing out to a certain degree. It's continuing to expand, but nowhere are we mandated to believe that it began here and then slowly came out. It could have began here and slowly came out. See, we have to look at all the possibilities. So it's not that science is bad, but we need to deal with fact and not theory. And all too often, scientists present what is theory, which cannot be totally supported by history, by scientific evidence, but they want to present it as it's true and it's not. Well, again, let me say, I believe that the word of God in the original autographs, meaning what Moses wrote down was indeed truth. Now, let me go off on a tangent. There is a very, very popular uh, uh, speaker. I don't want to say that he's a Bible teacher because he's really not. I don't think he would say that he's a Bible speaker. What he is is probably a, a counselor that uses the Bible somewhat. He's a motivational speaker that uses scripture now and then. But he does not believe that scripture is, is defensible, meaning this. When he spoke about creation, he used science much more. In fact, he said, you know what's important? We have testimony concerning the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. And that testimony changed the world. And because of that, we know that it's true. We're basing our faith on testimony that changed the world. Not necessarily everything in this book is, is correct and accurate and true. What a sad state of affair of this man's mind. When he does not believe in the authority, the absolute authority, the absolute truth of Scripture. No, what he wants to say is, listen. If you go back long before that we had a, a Bible, that is the Old and the New Testament together, realize that, that the gospel impacted and changed, for example, the Roman Empire. And that, he says, is proof enough to show him it's true. Look at the results. Well, see, there's something very, very dangerous, and that is this. See, what about Islam? Islam is changing much of the world. More and more nations are becoming Islamic. More and more people. It is changing things. Do we want to say because of that change, that growth, because nations are becoming Islamic, therefore it's true? <laughs> I sure hope not. So what we need to see is that confession of Scripture is fact. What the Scripture says is true. It doesn't matter what impact it may or may not have in a person's life. That doesn't change it. If someone says, you know what, I read this and um, I think it's fine, but it doesn't change me, does that mean that there's a problem with this? No. So once more, we need to be very clear on how we arrive at our theological doctrine. And the basis of all true doctrine is Scripture. Now, I left off in verse 2. I mentioned that the first word in, in verse 2 is the Hebrew word ve, which means and. It's a conjunction. But notice the second word. It is the word haaretz, meaning the earth. So what we find is this. In the verse 1, the earth. Beginning of verse 2, and the earth. Now, that is a very strong way of saying 
there is no gap. That there is a continuous thought. Now here's the problem as well. Any scholar knows, any seminary student of, of any, any uh, experience knows something. When we look at the Hebrew text from the manuscripts that we found, there are no punctuations. There are no chapters or verses that have been separated out. It's just one dictation. In fact, in some manuscripts, there's not even spaces between words. So what do we have here? Well, the whole methodology of saying after verse 1, but before verse 2, there's billions of years. Well, we don't see that when we look at the text. There's a continuation based upon two things. First of all, the conjunction, and secondly, the same subject. We ended verse 1 talking about the earth. Now it's in the form of a direct object. God created the heavens and the earth, and now he wants to talk about the earth. And he puts it into a construction with the conjunction to say there's a continuation here. So that fact and that fact alone shows a real problem for those who have that theory that there's billions of years between in the verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2. I was listening to someone speak, and he is a revered Bible teacher. He is seen as a, a very, very uh, uh, capable uh, interpreter of the Scripture. And, and I simply don't agree with that, that characterization of this man. Because what he said is this. You know, if the earth is billions of years old, whatever science says, it is. Really? We want to go along with whatever science says. You know, science is constantly changing. So we want to limit ourselves to whatever science says. That's truth. <laughs> very, very dangerous. No, what we find here is in verse 2, well, look at it. We see something very interesting. It says, and the earth was. Now, most of your Bibles will say empty, void, formless. It's the phrase, tohu vevohu, which simply means out of order. I have no problem with the translation empty, void, formless. All that's fine. But, but at the heart, we find that initially God's cre creation lacked order, his order. He made it, but it did not reflect at this time his will, but he wasn't done yet. Now, it's very problematic in my mind to believe that God created something which was out of order and he left it there for billions of years and did nothing. See, one of the things we learn later on in the scripture is that one of the purposes for creation, well, it's to reflect the glory of God. So why would God create all of creation, have it being empty, void, formless, out of order, if it didn't reflect in that current state his glory. It didn't manifest. It wasn't a praise to him. See, it's very problematic. No, what we find here is immediately God continued his work of creation. He didn't wait billions of years. Look again at verse 2. And the earth was tohu vevohu. Now, we see something in this first part of verse 2. Now, if you look and we find in chapter 1, there are 31 verses. 28 of these 31 verses begin with the, the verb followed by the subject. As I said, that's normative. And any time we have a violation of that, it's not an error, it's not a mistake, but it is unusual. And when something unusual takes place in the scripture, what is its purpose? Why is there something unusual that's a violation of the norm, the normative way? The purpose is to call our attention to that. It has the purpose of emphasizing it, having it stand out, saying this is important. So what did God do here? 
He inspired Moses to write verse 2 in a different way, a way that violated the norm. This is one of the three times in chapter 1 that we don't find the verb first to be followed by the noun. We found the noun first to be followed by the verb. Now, what do we have? We have veha arts haita tohu vevohu, and the earth was out of order or empty, void, formless. But there's something else. Not only that, but we see another change. Now, here again, if you look, for example, in verse verse. Three, we find here, Vayomer. Now that means, and he said. But it's really in the future. I said, and he said, that's in the past. Well, that same letter, the Vav in Hebrew, when it is applied to a verb, it frequently changes that verb from being in the past to the future or the future to the past. And when you go through, you find over and over and over and over in this first chapter and in most chapters in, in the Hebrew Bible that we like to attach the ve, that is the and, the Hebrew letter vav, which means and. We like to attach that primarily to the verb. But here we didn't in verse 2. We purposely changed the order, we violated the norm, and put the subject first to be followed by the verb and attach that letter vav to the noun rather than the normative way to the verb. Why? All of this stands out. It makes that conjunction even more emphasized for the purpose of it being a conjunction and not something else, not what's called a vav consecutive, which means a vav for the purpose of changing the tense of the Hebrew verb. So, very significant. In other words, we see that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, things were utilized, grammatical constructions were utilized, abnormal ones, for the purpose of emphasizing to the reader that there's a continuous thought. He left off with talking about the earth and he continues in verse two talking about the earth. And he puts the conjunction in the location which emphasizes this continuation rather than, than going with the normative way and placing it on the verb which would take the conjunction possibly out of the equation and simply seeing it as a vav consecutive rather than a, a straight conjunction. Now, this may not be all that exciting to you. For some of you, the, the grammar may be, be new and, and difficult, but, but believe me, this is where the nuggets of truth are found in the Scripture. And that's why it's very important that when people teach the Word of God, it is Scripture. It comes to us grammatically. And if we're not concerned about these grammatical constructions, well, then we are going to miss out on God's revelation. Well, let's continue. And the earth was tohu vevohu, empty, void, formless, or simply out of God's order. Now, when something's out of God's order, when it does not relate to his purpose, what do we find next? Vehoshek, which is darkness. So initially, see, the scripture says, God is light. But what do we have? We have darkness. So what the scripture is trying to say here is this. Initially, we did not see God in the midst of his creation. Now, is he? He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But the scripture is trying to say in this form of creation, being empty, void, formless, out of order, it's, it, we don't see God's presence. So when God's presence is not in our life, when we're not walking in the light, when we're in darkness, we're not going to reflect His will. We're not going to be doing His purpose. We're not going to be in His program. And that's one of the applications for us as a reader. 
Well, again, middle of verse 2. And darkness was upon the face of the Tahom, that is the abyss. So we look and we see down first. We see that there's a connection between darkness and downwardness. Well, we know in the scripture, when we look at the Apostle Paul, he talks about God's purposes, his plans for your life, for my life, as an upward call. But if we're in darkness, we're going to be looking down. We're not going to be looking up towards the heavens, which, which relate to God. We're not going to be seeing him. And therefore, we're not going to be living in a blessed manner. That is completing the purposes of God. Once more, and darkness was upon the face of the, the deeps, the abyss. But it says, and the spirit of God. Now, I'm going to give you an interpretation now. Up until this time, haven't tried to give you interpretations, just the simple interpretations of the Scripture based upon the words themselves, the order of the words, the construction of the words. But I want you to know that, that in rabbinical Judaism, they place great significance on this phrase, ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God. And what they say is this, that there's a connection between the Spirit of God and Messiah. Now, we know from the book of Colossians, when we get right down to it, it was not God the Father who created the heavens and the earth. It was God the Son. That's what Paul reveals in Colossians. Not only was he the creator but also he's the sustainer of, of all things. And that's an important truth that we'll have to set aside for another lesson. So the Spirit of God, Merachefet, that is the best way to translate that, hovering. He was there. He was not in the deep, but he was above the deep. Likewise, we could say that there's a, a separation between darkness and and the Spirit of God. In that term, Merachefet, hovering over, in other words. And he was hovering over the, the face of the waters. Now, another important point that we need to see is that water is mentioned in this, this text. Water is synonymous with blessing. Water is synonymous with life. And what we should derive from here is that there's a connection between the Spirit of God and water. That is to teach us there's a connection between the Spirit of God and life. What I'm talking about is the life that God wants you and me to have, which Messiah came to give to us, which is life in abundance. That word, when we look at it carefully in the book of John, it's a life that is abundant, but it's also that term literally is ever increasing. I mean, growing, maturing, growing. It's something good. It's something that's alive and moving and, and building. It's not stagnant. It's building up, not being torn down. So darkness was upon the face of the deep, the abyss, but the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters or the surface of the waters, however you want to translate the phrase pane. Look now at verse 3. Now, what brought about change in God's creation? The answer is His Word. What Judaism teaches, and it's right here, that what brought about godly order, remember the problem with His creation? It was empty, void, formless, or lacked God's order did not reflect his glory. And therefore, God created all things, and immediately he began to do what, what we call in Hebrew, and it's an important word, and that is the word tikkun. Tikkun is repair. Now, someone might say, why would God create the world in need of repair? The answer is, in order to teach you and me who were born into this world in need of repair. See, all of this is revelation to impact our life. So once again, verse, verse 3. And God spoke. 
He said something. And what did he say? Yehi or. Vayehi or. God said, let there be or, that is light, or literally, there will be light, and vayehi or, there was light. Now, where did this light come from? Well, the same place that everything came from, and that is from God. God spoke in here. I would say it would be God the Son, Yeshua, that is Jesus. He spoke, and there was light. Now, that really supports what we find in the Gospel of John, and that is this, that Yeshua, that he is the light of the world. The word here is cosmos, which is all of the universe. So he who is the light of the universe spoke light into the universe. That's what the scripture is trying to tell us. Look now at verse, verse 4. Now here it says, And God saw that the light, that it was good. Now two things we need to, to, to realize before we move on. And that is light, more often than not, is seen or understood biblically as a basis for revelation. So the first thing we see here is that God wants to give revelation. The purpose of his creation is to reveal himself. Secondly, when we look at this passage, we see that God saw that it was good. Now, does that mean that God didn't know that? No. What it means is this. There's a perception here based upon outcome. And this is teaching us something about God's nature, how he functions. Here's the, the, the implication for us. Now, does God know everything? Yes, he does. When does he know everything? He always knew everything. But many times in the scripture, what we find is that God causing something so that he might know, but the real reason is so that we might know. Until things are actually done, the scripture says they're not known. Now, does God know them before? Yes, he does. But to show us the outcome, the actual deeds, what we do does indeed matter. Secondly, even, God, even though God knows, that knowledge is not necessarily the cause behind it. Now, what else can we say about that? Prayer makes a difference. Does prayer cause uh, God to be surprised? No. Does prayer cause God's perfect will to be changed? No. But prayer can bring God's perfect will into being. What does that mean? Well, through prayer, what may not be for me can be. And what's that can be? The fulfillment of God's will. Through prayer, it doesn't change God, it changes me. Prayer can bring God's perfect will, not just his permissive will, what God allows, but the purpose, the plans, God's intent into my life. Here's a statement that you need to understand. Not everything that happens in the world is God's intent. Does that mean that God's not sovereign? No, it does not mean that. Does it mean that things happen outside of God's will because God wasn't able to, to make them be? No, it does not. It means that he allows things. That's why I say his permissive will. He permits things. A choice, a real choice. And you know what prayer does? It doesn't change God's choice. It changes our choices that we might agree with him. Well, here again, we're moving into some areas that uh, are better yet saved for, for other biblical texts. But look again to, to verse 4. And God saw the, the light, that it was good. Now, good for what? Well, good means in accordance with God's purpose, his plans, his will. There's a relationship always between the word good and the will of God. And then we find a very important word, this word, vayavdil. Sometimes we'll see it in a different form, the word lavdil, to make a, a distinction. Now, this word is very, very important. Why? Because if we are going to be faithful to God, 
If we are going to serve him properly, we need to know how to make distinctions. We're going to have to know how to distinct, make a distinction between that which is his will and that which is not his will. And that's what the scripture is trying to convey to us when it says God saw that was good. We need to be able to discern what is good. We're called to be like him. So all of this is written in a way for us to understand God's character and how his character must be if we're going to reflect his glory. His character must be our character. So God saw uh, the light and that it was good and God made a distinction between light and between darkness. Now this is important because we're going to see that light and darkness are going to be put into terms as good and evil. Light being good and darkness being evil. So when we make a distinction between light and darkness, we're able to discern between good and evil, that which is God's will and that which is outside of his will. We, in order to be faithful to him, we have to be able to make that distinction. We have to have that discernment. And this is a major part of, of Genesis chapter 1, showing us the methodology for having discernment in this world. So look at verse 5. We see here, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And it came about an evening, it came about a morning, one day. Now, there's a couple things I want to say about that last part of verse 5 before we, wrapped up, we wrap up. And that is this. It's very clear that we're speaking about literal 24 hours, a evening and a morning, one day. We're not talking about a day and people say, you know, it says in the scripture uh, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So time to him is different. And therefore, maybe we're talking about not a 24 hour day, maybe millions of years. No, that's not the case. He says an evening and a morning, one day. Now, I realize some of your Bibles will say the first day. It does not say Yom HaRishon. The first day. It says Yom Echad, one day. Now why? What is the purpose for saying one day instead of the first day? The reason is this. One of the meanings of the number one, the Hebrew word for one is Echad. We get, we, we take that same word and we put it in a different grammatical construction and we come up with the word Achdut which is just a, a, a process of changing a word into another part of speech. And what we find is the word echad is unity. So in Hebrew, the word for unity comes from that same root in Hebrew for the number one. So what are we supposed to derive? Not that this is just the first day, although it is. But it says one day. It's defining to us what a day is, an evening and a morning. In other words, God couldn't have said it any clearer. Secondly, what is the purpose of this revelation? To bring unity between all of his creation. That is, as we'll see when we get to the sixth day, between humanity and God. And it's only when we find his will, that is, we're living in light. We're able to make a distinction between light and darkness. What does it say? Come into the light. Walk in the light. So all of this is for one primary purpose, and that is to teach us how to walk with God. And what do people want to do? Well, they want to go to science, and, and much of the theories of science, not even the proper conclusions of science. And we're going to see that, how science, what it says, is false in regard to much of its claim in regard to evolution. And I'm going to show that without a doubt when we get into the later days. So we don't want to believe the theories of man. I don't want to base who I am, my eternity, upon science. 
Because what was great science 200 years ago <laughs> is proven oftentimes false today. No, I want to base my future, who I am for all of eternity, base my salvation upon the truth of God. Allow His revelation to become the foundation of my life and your life. And you know what? You're not, when you walk in light, you're not going to have regrets. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have a life of abundant praise to Him. And that's the purpose of these Bible studies, to teach us how to walk and to live in a manner that is praiseworthy. That is, what we do praises Him. And the more we understand about creation, the more we understand from the book of Genesis, the better able that we are going to be able to bring Him glory, being empowered by His grace, being guided by His Spirit, and walking in his truth. Well, I'm out of time until our next installment in Love Israel Bible Study. And I hope that you'll tell others about this study. We're going to try to add a new installment every week. But again, this is not the television program. This is extra content that we're providing, that we're doing the work, we're expending the resources that we have in order to give you more of, of teachings based upon a right confession of the Word of God, that it's His truth, it is perfect. And for those who submit to it, the perfections of God are going to be seen even in imperfect human beings. Because what does God like to do? He likes to transform us into His faithful, obedient servants. Again, until next week, May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.